This week on the Back Table Podcast. We've got amazing genetic counselors here. Our cancer genetics group is phenomenal. And yet if we referred every patient who we recommend to consider germline testing, if we referred all those patients to cancer genetics, it would be months and months. And we did that, you know, seven, eight years ago. And the wait times weren't even that terrible because, you know, we weren't recommending testing for nearly as many people as we are now. And yet still so many patients would just drop off, right? They'd say, yeah, three months later, they forgot about it. They don't make the appointment. We just weren't being that successful. So that's when we really started a clinician focused counseling and testing plan, you know, protocol. And so that's what we do. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Begrode as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Todd Morgan from University of Michigan, where he is a full professor and chief of urologic oncology. Welcome to the show, Todd. How's it going over there? It's awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Listen to a bunch of them, and you're doing God's work here. Well, thanks, Todd. It's a little bit tricky. I feel like any good idea I've had, as soon as I look it up, it's already kind of been done in a major way by music urology. Ha. The rest of us are just trying to follow in your footsteps. Today, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about germline testing and prostate cancer. Even over the course of my training fellowship, I feel like it's really shifted kind of into the mainstream in a big way. Maybe we could just like start out with some basic terminology, germline testing, molecular testing, genomic testing. How about we just start out with germline testing? What does that kind of mean for you? The terminology is imprecise. I think most of our terminology in medicine, it gets confusing when we talk to patients and it gets confusing when we talk to each other even. Germline is the easy one. There's a really clear definition. We're talking about inherited changes in DNA. This is DNA in our whole body that we're born with and it's not specific to the tumor. We can identify germline changes in blood by looking at cells in the blood. We can identify germline changes by looking at saliva. We can identify germline changes in any cell in the body. So that's an easy one. Okay, fantastic. Genomic testing, that's not gonna be the main focus for today, but can you talk a little bit about what that triggers in your brain? Yeah, this is where it gets imprecise, I think. And I think it means different things to different people, but really the genome is all of the, DNA in our body. But when we talk about genomic testing, I think people often use it to mean molecular testing of tumor cells. So looking at DNA or RNA in tumor cells and encompassing also changes in the germline, encompassing gene expression classifier tests. But like you said, we're not, I don't think, going to focus on it. Happy, happy to chat about it. But there's, you know, we're thinking about the cipher, oncotype, Prolaris. Those are tests that have basically nothing to do with germline changes. So specific to the tumor you know, having more RNA or less RNA. But again, the, the genomic testing term, I think, is used as a much higher level, broader and kind of vaguer term. Yeah, and I think it's even to get a little bit more confusing for patients where probably NGS takes a little bit of role in prostate cancer diagnostics with PARP inhibitors and things like that. But we won't make that a focus for today. But germline testing, every cell in the body, inherited changes, that's kind of what we're talking about. So new diagnosis, prostate cancer patient, you know, what are the kind of critical elements of the history, physical, past family history that you're going to dive into here? When you look at current guidelines around germline testing, there's a focus on a few things. One is what's their stage? Is Do they have metastatic cancer? Because if a patient has metastatic cancer, boom, they've, they've hit one of the criteria that indicates that germline testing is recommended. And so that's really important right off the bat. Then we get into levels of risk stratification and localized prostate cancer. And so for a patient with intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer, germline testing can definitely be recommended, offered, especially for high-risk localized prostate cancer. The family history component is one that is, I think, just underappreciated. It's one that, you know, who has time to sit down and take a really great family history? I know we all have very busy practices, and yet it's so fundamentally important to this, having some way to capture not just family history of prostate cancer, which I think is what most of us have always put in our clinic notes, right? No family history of prostate cancer, or fam plus family history of prostate cancer, but actually collecting the information about breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer. And 
age of diagnosis, especially if it's, say, breast cancer? And is it a first degree relative, father, mother, brother, sister? And did they die of their cancer? So it's actually, you know, I mean, it, it's not a ton of information, but it is information that takes additional time that we need an easy way to do it is questionnaires that we ask patients to fill out and that we actually take a look at because those criteria around, and I'd recommend folks looking at, say, the NCCN family history guidelines, or it's really the germline testing guidelines for familial cancer. Prostate cancer is not in the name, but it specifies breast, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. But there is really important information on prostate cancer testing, but this it's also carried over into the prostate cancer guidelines. And so that's where we get into looking at, well, you know, and we don't need to, I think, get too deep into the weeds on this, but basically family history of some of these cancers, if a first degree relative died of prostate cancer, well, that, that's another criteria, right? So a patient with lower risk prostate cancer who has one of those criteria would also be recommended to undergo germline testing. And then finally, there's, there's other criteria like Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry and a diagnosis of prostate cancer or say cribiform histology. So these are kind of the other things we need to be paying attention to when we're thinking about who should undergo germline testing. Yeah, I got to say that for me, I kind of think about it like there's the patient's prostate cancer, and that's kind of the easiest ones, you know, introductal histology, T3A or greater, high risk disease, metastatic disease, including node positive, kind of as you mentioned, those to me are a little bit more straightforward. And anybody that's got those criteria, you know, it's, it's kind of reflex any germline testing. And having moved recently, I do see one of my predecessors, prostate cancer patients, and my contribution to their care is typically, hey, you actually had high risk prostate cancer. Let's just make sure that we get you updated for germline testing. You know, they're all doing fine from a continence cancer perspective. So I think, you know, just kind of throwing that out there, if you're picking up a practice or you've been in practice for a while and you've got your patients that are five, seven, 10 years out from their prostatectomy or radiation, that there's still an option to, you know, make sure that they're getting 21st century standard of care germline testing. Yeah, that's a great tip. What do you say when the patient says, well, why should I do it? Well, I just say, well, I'm going to pick your brain on this. There may be some benefits to you down the way should you develop metastatic disease. This could have some implications on screening your siblings, your children, for instance. So that's kind of the short answer that I'll give them. We'll maybe talk a bit about the counseling, who does it, who's ordering the testing as we kind of move on. So cancer-wise, T3A disease, grade group four, high PSA greater than 20, node positive, metastases, introductal cancer, those are kind of the no-brainers. Then the family history, I think, as you alluded to, the kind of punchline that I try to teach the residents and the fellows is it's not just prostate, it's breast cancer, endometrial cancer, lymphoma, leukemia, some biliary cancers, and Lynch syndrome type adenocarcinomas is kind of how I think about it. What do you think about that, Todd? Yeah, I agree. I think the reality is the data for the family history criteria aren't great. As far as we know, really, the, I mean, of course, we think family history is important, but there are lots of reasons why patients don't know their family history that well. If you look at the data around correlating family history with rates of germline mutations in prostate cancer, it's not that strong. Mm -hmm. It exists for sure, but it's not that strong. And getting too bogged down in the weeds on the family history criteria, I think detracts from us counseling enough patients around germline testing. And so just like you said, let's pay attention to these other cancers. Let's recognize when people have a family history of them, we should really, it should raise red flags when somebody say has a relative who died of prostate cancer at 70 or who died of breast cancer at age 60 or 70, was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 45. So th those, are, those are like things that just suddenly raise red flags when we, when we hear them. Still, when we hear about a family history of any of those cancers, prostate, breast, ovarian, colon, pancreatic, and our patient has prostate cancer, we should probably be having that discussion around the role of germline testing for that patient. Yeah, that's excellent advice. If the net is kind of loose and we're sending more people for testing, that's probably not the worst thing. And I'm sure fast forward five, 10 years, they're going to say the incidence of germline testing as we've identified more and more variants is actually quite high and these populations just do it. So there's the pathology cancer criteria. There's a family criteria. What about like decision making? Some reports out there that folks on active surveillance that have germline mutations have a slightly higher rate of requiring definitive treatment or slightly worse outcomes. Are you using germline testing in your clinical decision making? Yeah, I think you can't ignore it, right? We don't want to ignore it. In a patient with localized cancer, you know, has low risk disease, the only germline, you know, mutation that might factor in is BRCA2. 
there's tons of data around BRCA2 driving more aggressive prostate cancers. And yet the only real study in the active surveillance space came out of Hopkins and it had 11 patients who were on active surveillance who had a BRCA2 mutation. And over time, they had a higher rate of reclassification. And so that's really interesting data. It, you know, it's believable. And yet, is that enough really for us to, you know, say to our patient with low risk prostate cancer, who we know has, is really, really unlikely to die of their cancer eventually? Is that enough for us to say, you know what, we actually, you should have surgery or radiation? The way that I incorporate it is to discuss it, to say, you know, we do think that you're at much higher risk of progression over time, meaning progression from, say, grade group one and grade group two or three, but still the odds are far and away that we will catch it in time and we will still have an opportunity to treat you within that window of cure. And some patients may say, you know what, I really prefer to undergo prostatectomy or undergo radiation. And I don't think it's unreasonable with, you know, in the shared decision-making context for those patients. I think of it a little bit more, say, a prophylactic mastectomy for a woman with a BRCA2 mutation. And so it's, you know, I think that's prophylactic surgery and can be appropriate for that specific instance. But that's really, that's the only one of the germline mutations that I would allow to factor into that low risk, localized disease conversation. At the other end, for a patient who's got, say, high risk disease and one of these mutations, there's no question that they are at increased risk of metastasis. And so what I wish is that we could have the conversation with those patients that says, not only are you from a prognostic standpoint at higher risk of progression, but hey, we've got treatments that we know are more effective or clinical trials that we can offer you. And at this point, we're short on clinical trials, say, you know, and we can talk more about the role of PARP inhibition, but say a neoadjuvant PARP trial or a platinum trial for a patient with a DNA damage repair alteration. But those trials are coming. They, they're going to be really important. I'm super excited. We bet you got a neoadjuvant al lap rib trial. It's kind of a nice segue when we talk about incidence of some of these mutations. Quick question. Do you have patients that are coming in that have been screened, detected to have BRCA mutations? No diagnosis of prostate cancer, and they're asking you, Dr. Morgan, what should I do? Yeah. So we actually have a clinic for those patients, and we've had it open for about five years now. And it's modeled after the high-risk breast and ovarian clinic. So same thing for women who are carriers, but aren't known to have, say, breast or ovarian cancer. And so for this population, it, it's on a study protocol. It's for patients aged 35 to 70 who have known mutations. And the way that most of them have their mutation picked up is a relative with a BRCA2 mutation or with Lynch syndrome. And so they've undergone cascade testing and been identified to have a mutation. And again, it's like historically, whereas the women with these mutations could be referred to the high-risk breast or ovarian clinic, men with these mutations have never really had a home. Mm -hmm. And so there are a handful of centers. Ours is one, University of Washington slash Fred Hutch, NIH, Jefferson, who have a home for these men to come in to have really close screening with a urologist. On our protocol, again, it's on a study, we use lower PSA thresholds. So a PSA threshold of two for patients who are under 50 and a PSA threshold of two and a half for patients who are over 50 as an indication for biopsy. We also use one of the urine biomarker tests. We use select MDX as part as kind of another backstop for patients with a PSA below the threshold. So if that test is abnormal, then we'll recommend a biopsy for those patients. As part of the study at the NCI that we're closely collaborating with, and it's kind of a parallel trial, they are able to offer MRI also. And so some of our patients will also go to NCI and have their MRI there. The, the thought being that it's very difficult for us to get an MRI covered. Say they, maybe they have a BRCA mutation, but they have a PSA of one, usually not going to be able to get an MRI. But by going to NCI as part of that study, they can get that MRI. And so that's been really successful. And we have identified earlier prostate cancers in this population. And, you know, it's kind of modeled a little bit after the IMPACT trial in the UK. Yeah, that's amazing. And what a commitment to do that, both at obviously your all's level and for the patients as well to, you know, take the trip and kind of go down that route. You're sitting there with the patient. You're, you've kind of brought up germline testing. You meet the criteria. What are some kind of general numbers that you share with the patients in terms of the likelihood of picking up something abnormal? And maybe we start with metastatic disease, localized disease. The real rule of thumb number is a 12% in metastatic disease that comes from Colin Pritchard's paper in New England Journal of Medicine. And so that's, you know, when I talk with the residents about this, that's like, you just ingrain that in your mind, 12%. Is it really exactly 12%? I mean, there are other studies and it probably ranges somewhere from 10 to 15%, depending on the population. And we know that germline changes really vary based on population and where patients reside. 
So that's a rough number for the metastatic population. In localized disease, there's a broader range, and it probably depends on where the data comes from in terms of disease characteristics, family history, again, region. But the numbers that I give are, I say, somewhere in the 5 to 10% range, roughly. And I think it's a really important point because when we have these conversations, we say, you know, this is important. And, and you know, there is a 5 to 10% chance that you may have a mutation that we would find. But also, by the way, there's a 90 to 95% chance that it's going to be negative, And that's going to be really reassuring for you and your family. Absolutely. So when you're explaining why you're getting this to the patient, kind of walk me through that conversation. In the metastatic setting, it's it's a much easier discussion, right? Because there's, I mean, there's PARP inhibition that's been approved in castrate-resistant disease. There are trials and data in earlier stage disease. The chance that it may be clinically useful is much more proximal. In localized disease, you know, one of the first things we say is, well, it's probably not going to have an impact on your treatment right now. And hopefully will never have an impact on your treatment. And in fact, I'll kind of mention it as part of our initial new patient counseling discussion and say, you've got enough on your plate. We're going to circle back to this a few months after surgery or after, you know, a few months after radiation or after you've started surveillance. Let's get back to this, but maybe give some educational materials for them to think about. But then why is it recommended? Why should you think about it? It could be important in your future. It could be important not just in your future because of your prostate cancer, but in terms of your risk of other cancers. It may be important for family members. And so if you've got kids, siblings. We may find something that's really important for them. We also may find that you don't have a mutation. And again, I think when you have these conversations, most maybe people diagnosed with cancer assume that there's a genetic component. And oftentimes the test results are really reassuring and kind of takes that largely off the table. And so, so that really is a, a strong argument. And so, but harping on the cascade testing piece can be really helpful. And I, and I think it's home. And I, and I really believe that it's incredibly important. Absolutely agree with all of that. You know, sometimes I feel like when patients don't have children, they feel like this doesn't matter. And I think it still matters for their own personal cancer screening that they are at risk of other cancers. You know, it's a good time to just remind them that, you know, the colonoscopies and all that kind of stuff is pretty important. I think siblings is one that might be a bit of a less focused on topic that, you know, many people do have siblings and they don't have kids. And it's like, hey, you know, this may actually impact your brothers and your sisters. And then, of course, bringing it back to them. I mean, today, you know, obviously, a neoadjuvant PARP inhibitor is not a kind of a standard of care. You know, if they have like a Lynch mutation and down the way they develop metastases, maybe they have a, you know, exuberant response to a checkpoint inhibitor. Tell me this, that neoadjuvant trial that you guys have, that's Raina McKay's trial. Is that right? That's right. And is that open? We are just going through the final bits of the IRB. We're kind of making sure that obtaining germline and NGS sequencing on all kind of high-risk prostate cancer patients that come in becomes a part of our workflow. I think it's probably realistic within the next six to eight weeks that we'll be open. Because that's a big deal, right? That changes the conversation completely. It goes from this maybe in the future and the cascade testing piece and all of that to, you know, this really could have an impact on your health and your care as soon as we have the test results back. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And it becomes really critical that germline testing, the germline testing discussions get incorporated into, you know, a urologist standard clinic workflow much earlier, right? So right now I say, let's come back to it in a few months. If we had that trial open, which I would love to, I would say, here's why we should think about this now. And I think patients would be um, interested. I know they would. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's conceivable like EGFR mutations in lung that you, know, you get reflex NGS testing, at least for certain mutations, you know, when the path comes back. A couple questions. Has patients ever asked you whether the identification of a germline mutation has any impact on insurability? Yeah. In fact, it should be part of any germline counseling education discussion. Hopefully, I've mentioned that before they've had a chance to ask. Because, you know, when we counsel patients about germline testing, it is not like ordering Decipher or, or ordering a PSA because it's not just finding something out about their cancer, you're actually finding something out about them that's heritable, that applies to other potential diseases. The reality is that for patients with prostate cancer, there are already issues around getting life insurance or disability insurance. And there are federal protections. There's the Gene Act, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that does have protections around, say, health insurance. But there are caveats for employees, I think, at companies with fewer than 15 employees. 
I give every patient a handout on Gina for them to review before undergoing testing. And I have this conversation. And, you know, again, it's like for the patient who has prostate cancer, well, their ability to get life insurance is already impacted. But before, say, their family undergoes genetic testing, and this is why this, you know, kind of shotgun population-based testing for people who are unaffected is much more complicated. And so, you know, while I'll go through this discussion and order germline testing for the patient with prostate cancer, for the patient who doesn't have prostate cancer, maybe has an elevated PSA and is really interested in genetic testing, I say, you know, I'm going to refer you to a genetic counselor for that discussion because that's not something that I'm prepared to really dive into. Yeah, it makes sense. And it is complicated. I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but even if you're ordering like NGS and there's tumor normal sequencing and they pick up an incidental variant, you kind of, now you have that information, you got to do something. What if the patient doesn't want it? You know, I think as we kind of continue to learn more about this, some of these ethical issues are going to come up. We're going to have to sort them out. Another one that I kind of get sometimes is, well, doc, you know, I got 23 and me for Christmas last year. Does that kind of cover me from like a germline? I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Are you good? So 23andMe is really interesting, right? So they do test for BRCA2. They test for, you know, a few of the most common mutations, but it is exceedingly limited. And so it is not the same as one of the commercial assays that we would order for actual genetic testing, which, we, you know, which would be a panel of typically, you know, it's like roughly 20 genes that are tested, depending on the company where you we get the testing or, or the in-house lab. But it's much more expensive, looks much deeper across all of these genes than, than 23andMe. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is actually totally accurate. I typically say that test is kind of the grade of it is for genealogy ancestry. It's not really clinical grade for, you know, looking at potentially pathogenic germline mutations. They're not exactly the same, despite the fact that they're using, you know, a person's genome and DNA. But you could envision a day when it is that great. They're fully capable of doing that, right? It's not. Yeah. It's not that hard. They could. They've got a lot of expertise. They've got. All, they've got all this data, and I think it's going to be interesting, don't you? It's like as the ability for the consumer to just say, you know what, let's have at it. Let's sequence everything. Patients will start coming in and saying, okay, here's what we found. What do we do? Yeah, I forget the name of it. I watched a rather disturbing movie on Netflix about an infertility specialist who was using his own sperm. And suffice it to say, you know, 60, 70 people out there were able to figure out that something's up wow. using 23andMe. Yeah, I remember that story. I don't know how I've missed the Netflix show, but I don't know if I'll watch it actually. I don't think I can take it. Yeah, it'll make you feel pretty unpleasant. All right, so... Finally, we've we've gotten to the decision that we're going to perform germline testing. And maybe I'll just, you know, share my experience. Three, five years ago when the NCCN kind of came out with their updated germline testing panel, the Philadelphia consensus, I felt really proud to be an early adopter. This is when I was at UT Southwestern, asked the question, sent it to medical genetics. And it was great. And then I came to San Diego about a year ago. And I think just because of the volume and the continued flushing out of the medical genetics team, it wasn't feasible for me to send, you know, 10 patients a week over to the genetic counselor's medical genetics. And Raina McKay, who's awesome, one of my partners was like, hey man, let's just kind of go through this. I'll show you how to order it. We'll come up with some dot phrases to sort out results. And we'll kind of dig into that a bit. But so who's actually ordering the genetic testing at your all's level for germline? Yeah, it's hope for us. Same thing. We've got amazing genetic counselors here. Our cancer genetics group is phenomenal. And yet if we referred every patient who we recommend to consider germline testing, if we referred all those patients to cancer genetics, it would be months and months. And we did that, you know, seven, eight years ago. And the wait times weren't even that terrible because, you know, we weren't recommending testing for nearly as many people as we are now. And yet still so many patients would just drop off, right? They'd say, yeah, three months later, they forgot about it. They don't make the appointment. We just weren't being that successful. So that's when we really started a clinician-focused counseling and testing plan, you know, protocol. And so that's what we do. It's the urologic oncologists. That means us. That means the APPs that we work with having the discussion. And the geomedical oncologist also, just like Raina is, you know, having that, that conversation. And it's totally doable. Again, it's not like ordering... A PSA, but it takes two, three minutes of counseling with some materials to really cover the needed ground, cover insurance issues, cover heritability, cover the odds that the test is positive, cover the odds that the test is a variant of uncertain significance. So that does take 
you know, you have to give that information up front, right? So this is what I say, roughly. 80% chance the test is going to be negative. That's great. We're, you know, we're in the clear for the genes that we tested. There's going to be, you know, roughly a 10% chance that we're going to have this gray area. It's called a VUS. It means there's something that we're going to have to keep a vague eye on. Most of the time, they're nothing. Every once in a while, it turns out to be something that, that does contribute to prostate cancer risk. And so that, that information comes out over time. That's the gray area. And then 10% chance that it's going to be positive. And so we got to be clear about what the result might look like. You know, we talk about what insurance, so you may have coverage, you may not, depending on the platform, the lab that we use. Usually there's a cap, out-of-pocket cap to the patient, often around $200. And so we'll, we'll mention that if we think the patient might not be covered for it. You know, we have the option of a blood draw, or they can send a, so this is really helpful for patients where we're doing video visits from, you know, all over the state. So we say, hey, you know, we can, the company can send you, the lab will send you a saliva kit. You know, come to the mailbox, you'll give a saliva sample and send it back in. And that's super convenient, just as effective as a blood draw. And we go over all those things. It takes a few minutes and you give the patient some educational materials. And oftentimes it's, okay, that's our discussion. Think about it. We'll circle back. We can order the test the next visit. If the patient really has a good understanding, they want to go ahead, we can order the test and also that same day. Two keys then is, one is I as an ordering physician, I'm responsible for that test result. Like anytime we order a test, we are absolutely responsible for giving the patient their result. So we cannot lose that information. You can imagine if a patient doesn't get Information about being a carrier, say, of a BRCA2 mutation, that's a big problem, and that's our fault. And so that's one piece. And then the second is we give the patient the result. If it's negative, great. But if it's positive, maybe some brief counseling about implications for prostate cancer, but then that's when we refer to genetic counselors. And that's when they can have a really well-educated discussion about what the test means, about what cascade testing is, about coordination of cascade testing. And it decreases the burden, right, by 80 to 90 percent for, you know, who, who needs to see cancer genetics. And it's really the patients who need it and have that discussion. Yeah, I think you basically covered everything that I wanted to touch base on for the remainder of the podcast. Huh. But I'm, I'm going to dive into these just a, just a little bit. So, I mean, first off, I think, you know, for these patients, their new cancer diagnosis, you know, the bone scans, the MRIs, the PET scans, you think about it, you make a cancer genetics referral. That's the initial intake to talk about exactly what you just described, and then a subsequent visit many times for the test and discussion of the results. So, you know, burden of treatment and diagnostics on the patient, not trivial. Healthcare dollars, expenditures, not trivial. So totally get that. And then, you know, as an early adopter, I, well, I don't know if an early adopter, as a convert from a high volume medical genetics refer to a high volume order of the test, I got to say, like the first time I got like a CFTR mutation, I kind of freaked out. I was like, oh my gosh, like, does this patient have like cystic fibrosis? Like, what do I do? Do I need to like call like everybody in his family? And, you know, I just called my medical geneticist and they were like, oh yeah, that's present in one out of 25 people. It's nearly never pathogenic. If they want to discuss it, fine. If not, like no big deal. I would encourage any urology department to have like a medical geneticist come over, kind of break this down and empower a urologist. There's no reason we can't do it. It's not rocket science. And like you said, 80% of the time, it's straightforward. You're benign, good to go, and everybody feels good about it. You talk about resources. I mean, music has amazing, amazing resources. Is there kind of a intro to germline testing, either handouts or video that you guys have put together that we can put a plug in for? Yeah, I wish. Not yet in music. So this is one of the things that's kind of, we've kind of been piloting in the background. One of the cool things with music is you can have access to the whole state with a really good quality improvement initiative. And around germline testing, what we've done is taken a couple sites, primarily us and Michigan Institute of Urology. Jason Haffron is a urologist there, a urologic oncologist with a ton of expertise in this space, who has similarly been approaching germline testing in his clinic and kind of embedded within music, uh, just a pilot study, collecting data, who's getting tested, what are the test results, and then looking to see how successful we are with, you know, how many mutations are we picking up? And using these data, which we're just analyzing now, to basically then come back to music and make the broader case, okay, we've got two sites of the music that have been really successful with this. Here's what we're picking up. If we implement a formal QI initiative across music, focus in this space, here's what we might be able to expect. And so my hope is that that will be coming over the next year or two. And this, as you know, as music has done with a lot of initiatives, it usually comes with a rollout of those education materials and videos that really help a practice implement a change. I really hope that we, we're seeing that in the coming years in, in music. One other study that we've done at Michigan is just assess patient feedback. So we've used validated surveys 
four patients who underwent oncologist-led, meaning urologic oncologist or medical oncologist-led germline testing of prostate cancer, just published it in a Journal of Urology just in the last month or two, led by Sophia Abusamra and Marissa Solorzano in my lab group. What we showed is that patients are really satisfied. Patients understand the information that they need to understand around germline testing. They really appreciate the opportunity to just do this all in one with their clinician who they're seeing. And when the referral is appropriately made to cancer genetics, kind of more on the back end, again, that's really successful and works out great. And so that's kind of the punchline of this is just like you said, we are totally capable of doing this. We just have to do it right. It takes a little bit of education, takes being thoughtful and not just ordering the test like we're checking a box, but it's a couple minutes of time. It's often a lot to ask for a couple minutes of time in our clinics, but it's a couple minutes of time well spent. I think you're spot on there. You know, when we are kind of initiating that, it's a care provider that they have a connection with. They kind of understand it. It's not like another party that they've never met before. Well, let's let's get a little bit into some of the specifics here. So, you know, I don't have any vested interest in any companies. I can speak a little bit to Invite. That's one I have the most familiarity with. So when you're ordering the test, you've got some options. You can order kind of pan cancer germline tests, you know, maybe 156 genes or so, some prostate cancer specific tests, or some fairly limited tests, you know, BRCA1-2. Let's just say that you're a urologist that wants to dip your toe, but doesn't want to go whole exome. You just want like the NGS panel of like seven genes. Any kind of opinions here? Yeah, that's actually a really important question. And the answer is the prostate cancer specific panel. It's that mid panel, 20-ish genes. Every testing lab has that mid panel. And the reason is that those are the genes that even amongst those 20 genes, the evidence for, as you start to get down the list of 15, 16, 17, 18, the evidence isn't that strong in terms of how much they drive prostate cancer and critically how much they drive aggressive prostate cancer. When you start expanding to the 100, 150 gene panel, you're, you're getting way out there. And the question is, okay, fine, great. You found a mutation that is, say, pathogenic or likely pathogenic in random gene X. What are you going to do with that information? You have no idea if it's associated with prostate cancer. The testing lab has no idea if it's associated with prostate cancer. There's some limited data somewhere that made them put it on that test. The cynic in me a little bit is says labs want to collect as much data about as many patients as possible. Data is power. Data is money these days. And it's not always in the patient's best interest to sign up for those extended panel tests. Okay. That's great. You know, something concrete there. And, you know, again, I have no vested interest. I think Ambry is another one that's fairly popular color. And I'm sure if you track down a rep, they could kind of walk you through how to put in a requisition fairly straightforward. For sure. Okay. So you've ordered the test. I feel like our typical turnarounds are somewhere in the three to four week range. You know, if they're getting a PSA that day, we'll just give them a kit. They'll take it to the lab. They'll get the blood draw at the same time. Otherwise, easy enough to send them out with a saliva kit that they can actually just mail in. I mean, one silver lining of COVID is that giving patients the autonomy and power just to like do stuff and be like, hey, you're like a you know reasonable adult, knock it out. So you've ordered your test and then the result comes back. The way I kind of think about this and you've alluded to it, either there's you know no variants identified, you're good. They can have some benign or likely benign calls. Then they can have some pathogenic or likely pathogenic calls, and then variants of unknown significance. Is that fair? Yeah, totally agree. Again, a key point is just at least mentioning that up front. All right. So you've kind of counseled them that, you know, broad strokes, either you're going to be good to go, there's going to be something that we've got to have you see the medical genetics for, there's going to be some things that we don't really quite know what they mean at, at this stage. So when they come back, Variant of unknown significance. I feel like this is one of those concepts that I have a bit of a hard time explaining to patients. They're like, this is a gene that's associated with cancer, but your particular mutation hasn't been proven to be associated with cancer. How, how do you explain that? I think it's okay to just, you know, I don't think we have to get too far into the details on it to just say, you know, look, we got a gray area. It's probably nothing, right? So we have lots of genetic changes in our DNA. You've got one that we identified in this important gene. We don't have enough data yet to say whether it's something that can cause cancer or not, but I can tell you that well over 90% of genes given this type of classification end up being fine. And well over 90% of these mutations are not harmful at all. We just have to keep our eye out. And this is the key take-home point. We just have to keep our eye out for any more information 
that might come in the future because the labs will issue an addendum to the report. That addendum to the report will come to me as the urologist. So I, again, I'm, I'm responsible. It will also come to the patient if they're signed up for the portal. So that's also really important to kind of just mention, hey, it's a really good time to say, just make sure that you're signed up on the portal and then it's not going through spam or whatever. And then if you get an email from Invitae or Myriad or whatever in the future, open it up and you know we'll, we'll keep an eye out too. Yeah. So one of the things that to me, because I actually had a little bit of pause and anxiety when I started ordering my own testing, you know, what if this variant of unknown significance or VUS becomes identified as a pathologic variant in two years, like, am I responsible for keeping up with the results, tracking down the family? And the fact that the the company's going to have this obligation to notify you so you can notify patients, well, it's kind of comforting that I'm not going to let something slip through the cracks that could impact a patient and their and their family. But yeah, I think it really can be that simple. You know, early on, just when you're using a new test, I think there's some appropriate amount of anxiety and caution. And then once you do it a little bit, you're like, yeah, this is pretty straightforward and and we can do it without too much of an issue or problem. I think those patients who get a VUS result, for urologists who are uncomfortable with that, which is maybe many or most, just referring those patients to cancer genetics is totally appropriate. And they can have a discussion around that specific finding. Again, it, like there's an issue around access. Hopefully, you know, by taking the 80% negative off the top, by ordering the test result, you've helped access. Yeah. So I couldn't agree more. A thousand percent, if people want to kind of have that discussion, I think they can. I think, like you mentioned, that preoperative counseling is great. I have a dot phrase I'm actually happy to share with anybody. Our tests aren't integrated into Epic yet, but when it comes back, I see it. And then, you know, my team knows to basically say, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we received the results of your germline test. If it was negative, this means there's no mutations. You're good to go. If it's positive, we're going to reflex put it in order for medical genetics. If it's a variant of unknown significance, these generally mean no further action is required. However, if you'd like to see medical genetics, let us know. And if something becomes pathogenic in the future, we'll notify you. Don't freak out. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, anybody listening to this, I'm happy to kind of share that. You can DM me or send me an email. Just a couple of things that I think are really super cool initiatives. The PROMISE study, are you familiar with that one? Yeah, there, there are two. I'm going to mess up on which one's which, but one is Veda Geary's. The other is Heather Chang's. Which, which one are you referring to? I actually don't know who the PI is. All I know is that it's prostatecancerpromise.org. We've got opened here. Basically, any criteria... They can log on, create a portal. They get sent the saliva kit yeah. from the NCI. This is Heather Chang's, yes. It's so easy. It's user-friendly. I love it. You know, we, we I put on all my AVSs for prostate cancer patients, and I think it's just, again, going to make this, like, yeah. super accessible to everybody. Great initiative. Really great. There's one I, I'm just blanking on the, you know, it's another one that starts with PRO, like every prostate cancer study. <laughs> I'll see if I can come up with it before we end here, but Vitagiri now at Yale, runs a DOD-funded study that basically is just a registry for men who undergo germline testing. And they can just sign up and submit their you know, little bit of information and their test results. It's going to allow for much greater collection of you know, who's undergoing testing and, and which patients are likely to have mutations and which mutations. When the results come back as positive, I do think it's important, at least for the kind of heavy hitters, bracket mutations, put that in some context for our patients, not just like we got the result, it's potentially alarming. You know, you're going to be able to sort it out the medical geneticist in like six weeks. What is your kind of first pass neurologic oncology counseling to a patient that has a, say, like a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the first pass is, I mean, it really depends on context. Let's say most of these patients have higher risk prostate cancer, and it's going to emphasize that they're at higher risk of progression and we're going to keep a really close eye on them. And then at this point, as long as they have localized disease, it's not going to change our management, but that could change in the future. They're, you know, kind of really emphasize that there's a lot of work going on in this space and some, you know, new exciting approaches to treatment. And, and so in some ways it can end up being an advantage to have this finding. And then the cascade testing and importance of seeing cancer genetics to better under understand you know, the implications for family members, I'll mention. And then I'll also mention that they are likely at risk of other cancers. And so there are other recommendations for prostate cancer screening that with the referral to cancer genetics, we will help coordinate. Perfect. Love it. 
Well, Todd, I think we've we've covered a lot as it pertains to germline testing and prostate cancer. You know, hopefully this is empowering to some people to start doing it. Anything that I've missed that you think is important for a urologist or urologic oncologist considering doing this? Well, I came up with Dr. Geary's study, which is PROGRESS. Okay. Right. So that's the PROGRESS study. Uh, really worth a shout out to that. And there's, there's you know, for both Dr. Geary and Dr. Chang's studies, they're easily found online and information around those. I mean, I'm so glad that you featured this topic on your awesome podcast. It's it's really important. It's something that we can do and we can change patients' lives and, and impact their family members. It's great to, to have the opportunity to talk about it with you. Yeah. Well, it's screamingly obvious that you've spent a lot of time thinking about this, doing it well, doing it the right way. And thanks for sharing your knowledge, Todd. You guys stay warm out there in Michigan and uh, look forward to seeing you guys out here at the SUO, I hope, in just a month or so. For sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Sabadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from... Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.